Hello, welcome, welcome to how to Necron basic, how to basic Necron, I don't know, um, yeah, so, me boys, Crons, they're fun, aren't they, the long and short of Necrons is, they used to be the ninth edition main antagonists, quote unquote. They were in the box set, but now it's tenth edition Tyranids. So Necrons haven't got too much stuff. They got a interesting Nemotech remodel. A quote from trademark Necron player, not a thought between those eyes. Yeah, fair. The old one, he looked menacing. He looked very menacing. He was just old. They just needed to make edges more edger, make him a bit taller. He could do the fucking same thing in Photoshop. Why they? Mm. Yeah. Uh, but Necrons, the beloved meme faction, literally just Pokemon with God. So that's fun. Hopefully, this guide will give you a basic understanding of Necrons. It should be a relatively easy tutorial to wrap your head around Necrons, their gimmick, and generally what they do, how they behave, what they're like, and their attitudes towards other Necrons. But the basic gist of it, to encapsulate Necrons very quickly and easily, is they are a really versatile army. Not like Space Marines that are semi-elite in the sense of even their spam armies where most of what you've got is cheap chaff they're still good necrons are versatile in the sense of they can either have a lot of shit quality units and be a horde army that if you do not wipe the unit they will come back so you have to pick them off one at a time and it's like the five men one gun thing from soviet russia that the army or they can go really really hyper elite with maybe a couple units of lich guard to really fuck your day up in destroyers they that's they're they're probably more versatile than space marines that's that's you boys that's necrons very very versatile they're also a bit tedious to deal with because their resurrection gimmick isn't based on detachment. That's their army rule. And it works by every unit rolls a D3 and they can either bring for every like point of health that they rolled there, they can either heal a guy or if that's enough health to bring a guy back, straight up bring a guy back. It used to be a lot more busted in 9th edition in the sense of if you just shot something on a 5 up their back, and sometimes they'd re-roll the 1s and add 1 to the resurrection, so it was on a 4 up re-rolling 1s, and they just reappear, and you'd just be staring there like, what the fuck, that was an entire intercessor squad into that unit, and you're still kicking. However, the resurrection gimmick has been dialed down a bit, to say the least. But their detachments are ridiculous, they're pretty strong. Which, speaking of, their detachments. Very interesting and versatile. There's one that if you have a character leading it, you add that one to the hit roll, or if certain units make attacks, they add one to the wound roll, which are your hyper elite armies. Of oh, You're leading pretty much an overlord with lich guard, a second destroyer overlord with some destroyers, add one to hits. Pretty much, you're hitting on threes, re-rolling well, ones normally. It's fucked. Or... You can go with the, I think it's just the Flayed One or Destroyer attachment, where it's like, they are cracked now. Those units are cracked, but Flayed Ones are pretty shit until melee, so just throw all of them at it. Or you can do the Translocation one, where a quarter of your army can go into Deep Strike, many in the battle size, and, you know... All of a sudden, there are Necron warriors behind you, and you're st you're still fucking wondering why the hell there's a, you know, monolith looking right down that firing lane. Parentheses, you're in the middle of it. Yeah. They're fun, they're fun. 
So generally, Necrons kind of just branch off into either elite or war. They don't do the semi-elite thing too well, like Space Marines. So generally, like I said, you'll have the Destroyer Flayed One blobs, or you'll go for 20-man spam units because they just keep coming the fuck back. And they're fun. They're really fun, but their lore is a lot more interesting. Before we go into the lore, it's important that you know the characters, because Necrons, their whole thing is that they're very stuck up and ridiculously petty. The only reason that Necrons, with their broken as fuck weapons, haven't straight up just taken over the galaxy is because they are so inconceivably petty. They hate each other far more than they hate the people on their lawn. So that's always fun to see. There's a book that came out, I think last year, called The Infinite and the Divine, which just highlights how petty you can get. They're arrogant, they're petty, and they're fucking hilarious. So let's start with some... Actually, let's start with some dynasties, because those are always fun. Then we'll move on to characters. So let's start off basic. And I got in during 8th edition and played Dawn of War 1. So Cesarekian isn't the main dynasty. It's Sawtech in my heart. They are the simplest dynasty to paint. You get a rattle can of lead belcher primer, spray it, you dip them in null oil, and you're done. Simple. They're the silver skeleton boys. Necrons, 100% you can see, were based on the Terminator from 1980s from the 1980s no, no, no. the terminator from 1980 because that was the man who made it john terminator fucking uh. so yeah you can see definitely where the inspiration came from in that color scheme they were the original poster boy scheme for necrons having a lot of the important named characters in that dynasty however they have died off as being the main ones they're they're the Necrons you'll see in all the video games. They're the Necrons. But when Ninth Edition came around, and they introduced new Necron sculpts, new Necron characters, they became sort of like, like how Behemoth is to Leviathan, Sawtech is to Cesarekian. Cesarekian Dynasty is now the main poster boys. They are mainly brass with like an almost silverish brass for head and shoulder pads. Still the green energy thing. Um, and they're called Cesarekian because Cesarek leads them. Wow. So, yeah, that's their... The Cesarekian dynasty are pretty much just Sawtech but 9th edition in different color palette because, I don't know, they needed new paints. That's really, really it. I'm not... They don't... As far as I'm aware, they don't really have a flavor, unlike the other dynasties, which we'll get into in just a second, because there are some funny dynasties. However, Necrons, they're good. They're great. Sawtech is, you spray, you, you prime them, and then you wash them, and that is it. So, Zarkin, same shit, different color. Easy. They also have the Silent King in there. We'll talk about him in a bit. But after that, we've got Nihilac. Now, they're special. I love them. I like their color palette, because it's like silver with gold and blue, and they're interesting. And they are the get-off-my-property-or-else dynasty. They're ridiculously territorial. They don't really ex expand and invade as much as other dynasties. But even if another dynasty starts stepping on their stones, they, like, get full-on cranky and walk out, be like, eh, fuck ah, <laughs> when you've got lasers and everything, it's great. On the other hand, you've got Novak, who are silver with red faces and shoulder pads. And the lore for why it's silver faces and shoulder pads is because that's just the blood of their enemies, because they are angry murder fuckers. They're the murder hobos of the Necrons. For Space Marines, you have Black Templars. For Tyranids, for Necrons, you've got Novak. 
They're great. They are... In 9th edition, they got better in melee. But in 10th edition, you don't get that. You, they're just a funny color palette with good lore. Moving on from that, you've got one of the favorite dynasties from, I think, my friends is Mefert. And they're, they're an absolute meme fest. Their whole thing is that they have busted as fuck weapon. They don't use green energy like all the rest of the Necrons. No, no, no. They drain stars, like in Star Wars, and weaponize that shit to have even more powerful lasers. Because Disintegration Beam wasn't cracked enough. They go the extra fucking mile. So they are silver with yellow, and they will drain the sun to kill you. And it's beautiful. And last but not least, you got Nefrect, who are anorexic custodies. They're just the gold one. Gold and green. It's an interesting color palette, but eh, it's very Aussie, my good stuff. But, um, yeah, that covers most of the color palettes that you can pick for Necrons. You can pretty much do the same flavor with most factions and will adhere to canon, sort of. Because the way that Necrons are, similarly to Eldar, is they've got their elite units that are just sort of around and do their own thing and look their own way, and then the rest of the army. But yeah. So notable characters are Cesaric, the Silent King, who is, I think, the most broken character in Warhammer so far. He's got the chunk, he's got the damage, he's got the melee, he's just cracked. His whole thing is that long, long ago, long before time, a little bit after the Necrons became metal, because the Necrons weren't always robot skeleton fuckers. They used to actually be flesh and blood, and then they went through this transference, which pretty much turned them from died at 25 because of cancer to immortal death machines. However, they sacrificed their consciousness. They didn't know about that little, you know, that little caveat. And so the people that remained their con with, con with their consciousness, you know, I stuttered there, got really, really mad. And then they went to sleep and the Silent King banished himself to figure out how the fuck is he going to fix this problem? Because they're a monarchy. The Necrons used to be united under the Silent King, who was the last Necron king. Then he fucked off. Because it's like, oh, no, I failed my people. I have to go find the cure. He left the galaxy. Like, full on, gone. And then he came back in 9th edition. Or back, I think a while ago, but in 9th edition, he like showed up. He like, haha, look at me. I'm three millimeters taller than your average guy. But my throne is the size of your tanks. And pretty much he came back and... He's confirming, oh yeah, there are more fucking territories. Get ready. Er. So he's back with the milk. He's fun. Imutek the Stormlord is the name character for Sawtech. I think that's before Vanguard Oberon and the other one. We got deleted from 10th edition, which is a shame because they're funny. But irrelevant. Imhotek the Stormlord is, he's a cool character. He's not a funny character, he's just straight up a badass. So he is the opposite of Nihilak. Not extremely expansive, very invasive, and murders everything that gets in his way. He's called the Stormlord because wherever he goes, a like cybernetic storm forms around him, which is kind of cool. That's why he's the Storm Lord, and he is cranky as fuck. He's Chapter Master Halbrecht's main rival, and the reason why he lost his arm. That's Emotech. He's the guy that cut off Halbrecht's arm. Yeah. So yeah. He's relatively honorable as well, though, so if you actually put up a good fight, he'll let you surrender and leave ashamed rather than just kill you outright because you're dying. Rarely, but it'll happen. 
On the other side of the spectrum, we've got Trazen the Infinite, the raging kleptomaniac of the Necrons. I, I think he originally came from Nihilac, but he just does his own thing. He doesn't fucking care. He has his museum in, like, a pocket dimension, which is an entire world of shit he just collects because he likes it. For example, he's got, straight up, a custodian in there. The perfect clone of Fulgrim. Along with, I think, a Psy Titan? And just other shit. He's a raging kleptomaniac and a massive troll. During the fall of Cadia, he showed up when Bilisar's call was like, how the fuck does this work? He was like, hmm. As you're having troubles there, would you like a hand? And then he'd be the guy that would actually like show up like a prostitute. Or it's just someone's hand when he says, would you like a hand? He's that kind of character. Ark and the Diviner, though. Time travel shenanigans. He's a cryptech, which is the other kind of Necron that exists. You have destroyers, cryptechs, and... So destroyer, cryptech, canoptech, and normal guys. Canoptechs are robots. Cryptechs are the guys that manage the robots. Destroyers are people that just go fucking insane and murder everything. And the normal guys are normal guys. So Orokan is a cryptech. He's really... He's pretty much tech wizard. That's his gimmick. He's a tech wizard. He's great. And... There's a book called The Infinite and the Divine, and fuck me, it's funny. Because it's literally just their thousands-year-old argument. Two senile old men yelling at each other for doing dumb shit and doing stupid pranks to make each other even more mad, and it is so funny. But yeah, Ark and the Diviner, time travel shenanigans. He's fun. And then last but not least, you have maybe one of the scariest Necron characters, or scarier Necron characters. Because he's he's cool. In concept, he's cool. But just thinking about what he does is a bit it's it's fucked. So he is this scientist who experiments with shit. I think for the purpose of trying to figure out how to undo their cybernetic transference and regain their souls. But also, he just does science shit and fucks around and finds out because he can. And that's it. He is the science guy. And he is terrifying because he has cracked weapons. Because the Necrons already have Broken fucking weapons, like genuinely broken. They're they have this they have this one weapon. It's a weapon, even though it's just a map. But everything that you edit on the map is edited in the fucking galaxy itself. They could use it to delete Terra instantly. That's like the levels of broken that Necrons have. That's that's how busted they are. However, Luminor Cesaris, he's the guy that fiddles around with that shit to make it worse. Well, worse for us, better for the Necrons. So that's the Luminor Cesaris. That gives you your main list of characters you can usually feel in the game. They're all fun. They all have their own gimmicks, much like Necrons. They're very individualistic. But they're because they're individuals, they're very petty. It's a bit of a... It's a bit of a logical fallacy saying that they're individuals because most Necrons lose their consciousness and their personality when or they lost it when they became machines, but now they live forever. Though some actually maintained it, and those people are just they just control the other Necrons because the fuck are you gonna do? You're they're pretty much robots. And they are very petty. Which in turn means that the armies they control are very petty. Which in turn means that the dynasties that they lead are very petty against each other. And now their main lore is generally... It's a bit weird. Because 60 million years before the current setting, there's a massive war 
even bigger than the Horus Heresy, than the current 40k setting, called the War in Heaven, where the Eldar and Crooks, which are the previous evolution of Orcs, rather, I wouldn't say devolution, because they are better, smarter, faster, stronger, with, with like far super, more superior technology, just every way better. They, those two were led by the Old Ones, who are the original creators of the galaxy and most of the races, against the Necrons. And the reason why this is, is because the Old Ones refused to help the Necrons, they got pissy about it, so instead, they made a deal with these random star beings, which are just called star gods now, but I think they used to just be weird energy beings that fed on stars. And they were very powerful. They gave them technology and all this stuff. And the Silent King, this is called foreshadowing, made a deal with a Catan shard, because they're called the Catan now. It's pronounced Katan, not Satan. It, it's a little mm, thing that it's an ache of mine when people say Satan, not Katan, but it, it is Katan. C apostrophe T A N. He made a deal with this Katan star god to make Necrons immortal and powerful. The name of this, the, the future name of this star god would be the Deceiver. For a reason that's going to become very obvious in a few seconds. Because when they became immortal and powerful, the souls of all the Necrons were fed to these star gods. The Necrons were deceived by the Deceiver. What? And for a while, the Catan star gods commanded the Necrons like their little toys. And they ransacked a bunch of shit and took over the galaxy, but didn't go well. Necrons then revolted against the Gatan and tried to kill them. As a matter of fact, they did kill one. And this Gatan, they only ever killed one because they learned their lesson. This Gatan, in his dying moments, put out a curse for all the Necrons, which still lasts until today and it is devastating this techno virus called the flare virus which slowly corrupts a necron who's exposed to it to eventually become a mindless cannibal monster deformed with big long claws double jointed knees and always hungry craving flesh they don't have any and they don't have mouths so they just drape themselves in skin and meat and shove it into whatever ports they can and that's the flare virus, turning them to mindless murderers. The Troy virus is just because they were fucking, they've been around for a while. So they're just finally experiencing, you know, dementia. That's the destroyed virus, pretty much. But the flare virus is a, the direct effect of them killing a Catan. So in turn, they decided they wouldn't kill them anymore. Rather, they'd break them up into shards and use those shards to power their shit. They put God in a Pokeball and use it as a battery. Necrons. That's them. And that's almost the plot of the war in heaven. Broke the Catan, turned them into batteries, shoved them into all their gear. But they also actually captured some of them and used them as units. Such as the Nightbringer, the Deceiver, or rather the Shard of the Nightbringer and Deceiver, and the Catan Shard of the Voider Dragon. Here's where it gets even more fucking rule of cool. The, the Shard of the Void Dragon was split in half and then into smaller halves. So one big half of the Void Dragon is out in the galaxy. However, millions of years later, in around the medieval era of Terra, the Void Dragon came to consume and kill and do dragon shit on Earth. And the Emperor of Man fucking kind rode out on his horse, defeated it, and in the medieval times, trapped it on Mars, deep beneath the surface, because he saw into the future and knew that when humans colonized Mars, having the void dragon in there 
would allow them to become far more technologically capable because the Void Dragon is a shard which gave the Necrons most of their tech. What the fuck? Well, this is way after the War in Heaven, which is Necrons with their Pokemon, went against the Eldar, almost won, then kind of lost, old ones died off, Quarks became a cart, retarded, they went to sleep, and Eldar became the superpower of the galaxy. Then, they start waking up in around Warhammer 40,000 era, 10,000 years after the Horus Heresy. And they also helped in the fall of Cadia, a bit, because, you know, Chaos is the ultimate enemy, they're the ultimate pricks, so they tried to stop them, and they sort of failed. And there's this cutscene where Belisarius' call is like, what are you, Abomination? And then Trazen's new friend is like, oh, you call me an Abomination? Oh, that's so mean. You should just call me friend, because I'm here to help. Right? And he gives that, like, sly look. Even though he doesn't have eyes. He has, like, two little green beads. And then he's like, what the fuck? Would you know this? And he's like, I was there when they were first constructed. And that's, like, a cheeky little hint to how old he fucking is. Because the Necrons are old. And the fall of Cadia was because the Necron pylons gave out, got broke, and then, you know, Abaddon had a hissy fit through a Blackstone Fortress, through Cadia, which is a planet-sized base. It's the equivalent of throwing the Death Star out of worlds. And then, no shit, the world cracked in half. Because you threw the Death Star at it. And so, oops. Normal pylons. Warp go burr. And now, Silent King returns, and there's this pariah nexus issue happening in around about the south-southwest of the galaxy, near Ultramar. Which was the main plot of 9th edition, and what the Indomitus Box and Indomitus Crusade are about. That the Necrons are showing up and doing a big fucking issue. Everything the pariah nexus, old warp-related stuff, has stopped working. And so, there's a massive crusade... That was going on has been disbanded because Leviathan's on the other side of the galaxy, but it's still sort of going on by the Salamanders. There's a series in Warhammer Plus called Pariah Nexus, no shit, about the Pariah Nexus, no shit, which pretty much details some of the adventures that happens in the Pariah Nexus. And that's another issue. And with that, that pretty much concludes Necrons. Slightly longer than I think in my usual videos, because there's a bit more. But they're fun. Good lore. Very good lore. Good in the tabletop. Yeah. Please, if you enjoyed the video, consider giving it a like. Perhaps subscribe. If you watched a little bit, good. If you watched all of it, even better. And I might catch you in the next one. But yeah, Necrons are funny. Like, Ash Ketchum the- Rocky Roll McDonald!